That's six grandchildren <laughs> and counting. <clears throat> it is great joy as always to be here. Last year, I actually missed the conference. It was the first conference that I had missed in 17 years. And as a result, I got, I think, seven or eight Doug Wilson books behind. <clears throat> I am so grateful to the Lord that he has no unpublished thoughts. <clears throat> the uh, veteran journalist Cal Thomas once quipped, the educational talk, uh, like the graduation address, is the peculiar province of the great American cliché. All that business of hope and wonder, of opportunity and adventure, cliches all. At ACCS schools, uh, we'll uh, toss around a few of our axiomatic slogans ourselves. Worldviews matter. Ideas have consequences. Uh, great teachers love what they love in front of their students. Uh, we don't just teach our students uh, what to think, we teach them how to think. Raising kids in a, is a timed event uh, with eternal consequences. The rabbit trail is the point. Do the next right thing. Kill the dragon, get the girl. Geronimo, amen. <laughs> Cliches are by definition stock phrases or expressions that have become that perhaps hackneyed and trite or banal by overuse. They are worn out platitudes, maxims, or axioms. Uh, they are tired and predictable declarations of self-evident truths. Clichés are, to use a cliché, old chestnuts. Sparkling prose, we're told, should always avoid such stagnant mire. Uh, good communicators, we are assured, think outside the box and avoid cliches like the plague. <laughs> Though admittedly, even that sentence is a bit like the pot calling the kettle black with a fistful of cliches, thick as thieves. Uh, the truth is, sayings only become cliches because they're true, or at least they are truisms. Uh, Tom Quackenbush has said, uh, cliches work by appealing to our collective unconscious. They are like the Puckel Bell Canon D of prose. Something familiar that can be uh, riffed off by the talented to create some distinctive work. Likewise, Terry Pratchett has quipped, the reason that cliches become cliches is that they are the hammers and screwdrivers in the toolbox of communication. Interestingly, even the word cliche comes from the workbench. It was originally a technical French idiom used as printer's jargon for movable stereotype blocks. These were small metal plates from which prints or designs could be reproduced endlessly without variety. This was called stereotyping. Uh, apparently, when the blocks were dropped into place, uh, they made swishing, clicking, and echoing sounds a bit like the rhythmical clicking of a clock. And the, as a result, the onomatopoeia, cliché. The English type foundries called this process dabbing, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> In any case, cliches are both literally and figuratively well-worn tools. Rafael Reyes has argued that cliches can actually be truth's most loyal friends. In the last decade of his life, Isaac Watts wrote a remarkable book, a, a book that was rooted in a single axiomatic principle, a, a truism, a cliche. 
it began as a question. If true education is, in fact, nothing more and nothing less than a lifetime endeavor in, a lifelong commitment to repentance, what would that look like? What might it entail? If education actually only begins when we're able to confess that we do not know what we ought to know, that we've not yet read all that we ought to read, that we've not yet become what we're called to be, if we've not yet done all that we're called to do, then education truly is at root an act of repentance. So what form should that take in our daily lives? He, he framed the question like this, that how is semper reformanda, that, that old cliche about being reformed and ever reforming, how is semper reformanda woven into the fabric of our lives? We know that Isaac Watts was a great hymn writer. He wrote more than 750 hymns, including Joy to the World and Jesus Shall Reign, but Oh God, our help in ages past, when I survey the wondrous cross, alas, and did my Savior bleed, I sing the mighty power of God, and my shepherd will supply all my need. Come Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, and a host of others. But he was also a pastor and an apologist and a remarkable figure in his day in education. He was born in Southampton in 1674 during the difficult days following the restoration of the Stuart crown. These are the days of fierce persecution against all of the Puritans and nonconformists. He was born into a, a, a nonconformist Puritan household. His father, also named Isaac, was at first a deacon and then an elder in Nathaniel Robinson's uh, little congregation, the Bargate Meeting House. He had formerly been uh, the rector of All Saints Church there on the southwest coast of England. Uh, but during the great ejection of 1662, he and 2,000 other Puritan pastors uh, were removed from pulpits and sent into exile and penury, many of them. They were difficult days. Charles II uh, was restored to the throne at the age of 30 in 1660. He reigned for 25 years. He was succeeded by his uh, brother, uh, James II, who reigned only three years. But during those 28 years, uh, there was uh, terrible persecution uh, meted out against Puritans and nonconformists. Uh, there was the great ejection of 1662. Uh, that was followed in 1664 by the uh, co uh, Conventicle Act, uh, which uh, actually forbade uh, secret meetings of Christians in barns or fields or uh, above pubs. Uh, then there was the Five Mile Act in 1665, which uh, forced pastors who held to Puritan convictions uh, to be no closer than five miles away from their uh, beloved flock. Uh, the exclusion crisis of 1679 to 81 uh, was a parliamentary struggle that intensified the Stuarts' persecution uh, against the Puritans. Uh, the Rye House Plot in 1683 uh, precipitated a fierce bloodletting that included uh, what uh, in Scotland is called the killing time, uh, when hundreds of Cameronians uh, were slaughtered uh, by the Stuarts' jackbooted troops. They were very, very difficult days. 
But Isaac Watts remained faithful, as did his family through it all. His father was imprisoned at least twice, the first time when Isaac was 10, the second time when he was 14. Uh, The family was forced to survive uh, barely on donations. Uh, Isaac's mother and uh, his eight siblings uh, did everything that they could to keep the family afloat. Uh, But through it all, their faith remained steadfast. Isaac was exceedingly bright as a young man. He began Latin at four, Greek at nine, uh, French at 10, and Hebrew at 13, all taught by his father. And he was a precocious youth, uh, beginning to write verse uh, at the age of three, In fact, oftentimes, he would actually even speak in verse, which actually drove everyone utterly mad. Uh, Nevertheless, he was marked out for an academic career, but of course, in those days, Puritans were not allowed to go to Oxford or Cambridge. And so, he was sent to a, a, a small tutorial in Stoke Newington, which is now a part of greater metropolitan London, but at that time was still a sleepy village on the outskirts. And there he spent most of the rest of his life. Though he lived a full and long life, he actually was quite sickly throughout most of his adulthood. Uh, Nancy Wilson reminded me of a wonderful story uh, this morning as we were talking in the hallway Uh, Isaac was not exactly a dapper fellow, and he wasn't, shall we say, particularly good-looking. He had fallen in love with a young lady who who was very attracted to his heart, his mind, his life, his convictions, his principles, uh, but she had to admit to him in Shakespearean prose that his face was sear. And she refused him. Uh, Nevertheless, he eventually became a pastor, uh, was ordained into the gospel ministry in 1702, uh, having begun as a pastoral intern at the Mark Lane Meeting House just outside of London at the age of 25 in 1699. He proved to be an able preacher, And uh, one congregant said, as long as one averts one's eyes, uh, one is altogether entranced by his preaching. (sighs) He was was a hard-working, thoughtful writer who composed constantly, uh, not just hymns, uh, but he worked hard in the preparation of tools to teach the children of uh, the Puritan parish uh, the basic principles of the gospel and of life, the universe, and everything. In 1724, he began work on a book on logic, uh, entitled Logic, the Right Use of Reason. Uh, It was published in its final form in 1726, and it was quickly seen to be a work of genius. It was used as a textbook at Oxford and in Cambridge. Uh, Across uh, the Atlantic, it was used as the primary uh, logic textbook at Harvard and at Yale. He followed that up with a series of apologetics tracts and, and works, uh, the chief of which was called The Strength and Weakness of Human Reason, uh, written in 1731. In a sense, the outline that John MacArthur gave us this morning of objectivity, rationality, veracity, authority, and incompatibility is the heart and soul of that particular book. He wanted to lay out the essential principle of the objectivity of truth and the ability of man through rational faculties to lay hold of these truths aided by and enlightened by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until at the end of his life, though, that he began to 
write down some of the basic principles that, that had guided his lifelong pursuit of learning. Uh, eventually, these were put down. In 1741, in the first draft of a, of a book entitled The Improvement of the Mind. It was never published in his lifetime. His disciple, Philip Dutteridge, made certain that it came into print in 15, uh, 1751. And it is a remarkable work indeed, because he works out in detail what repentance actually looks like when we pl apply it to the life of the mind. In the, the preface, Watts says, no man is obliged to learn and know everything. Uh, this can neither be sought nor required, for it is utterly impossible. Yet all persons are under some obligation to improve their own understanding. Otherwise, it will be a barren desert or a forest overgrown with weeds and brambles. Universal ignorance or infinite errors will overspread the mind which is utterly neglected and lies without any cultivation. Therefore, you should contrive and practice some proper methods to acquaint yourself with your own ignorance and to impress your mind with a deep and painful sense of the low and imperfect degrees of your present knowledge uh, that you may be incited with labor and activity to pursue after greater measures." So the book was essentially a list of, of guidelines for how to go about undertaking the task of lifetime learning, of lifelong repentance, of regularly declaring to ourselves, I don't know everything I need to know. I've not yet learned all that I need to learn. I've not yet read everything that I need to read. It's, uh, it's quite remarkable. It begins with that notion of semper reformanda and 10 basic principles. The first principle is simply uh, that when we undertake this task, we need to consider the weaknesses, frailties, and mistakes of human nature in general, which arise from the very constitution of a fallen soul united to an animal body. He believed that most of the great mistakes that we make in theology, in economics, in politics, in science, in business, occur because we failed to take into account the fallen nature of man. We tend to trust our thoughts and our feelings, but all the while neglecting the reality that we are fallen. And, and our fallen nature leads us into disaster time after time after time. The Bible describes this as concupiscence. It simply means that we are bent, we are inclined, to use Westminster Confession terms, uh, toward evil. A and that bent uh, can only be corrected uh, by the power of the Spirit and the liberty of the gospel. So what uh, Watts says is every time we sit down to study, uh, we ought to remind ourselves uh, of this fundamental truth. The heart is deceitful and wicked above all things and beyond cure. But when we realize that we are fallen, our students are fallen, their parents are fallen, their grandparents are fallen, every single person they know is fallen, the people that they drive down the street with are fallen, that changes everything and enables you to undertake tasks on the right foot. Secondly, he said, uh, we must contrive and practice some proper methods to acquaint ourselves with our own ignorance. And so uh, we must take a wide survey on a regular basis of the vast regions of learning and of our own unlearning. 
Uh, th this is uh, incredibly powerful. And it runs so contrary to everything that we hear in our society uh, these days. Uh, we're told to, to, to maximize our strengths. We're, we're told to focus on the things that we love and the things that we do well. And what Watts is saying is, it is a healthy thing when we take a broad estimate of everything that we're not, everything that we can't, everything that we won't. Third, he said, I presume not too much upon a bright genius, a ready, uh, uh, a ready wit and good parts, uh, for this, without labor and study, will never make a man of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, neither must you imagine uh, that large and laborious reading and a strong memory can denominate you wise. What he's calling for here is uh, uh, what uh, Thomas Chalmers called the baseline for all scientific inquiry, humility. When we enter into studies, uh, when we enter into a lifetime of learning uh, with this profound sense of humility, then we will be able to begin the process of really growing and learning. It's, it's the gospel orientation, isn't it? It's the profound gratitude uh, that we have when we realize that the God of the universe has poured out grace upon sinners like us. Uh, what a marvel this is. How sweet and awful is the place with Christ in the doors. That notion <clears throat> runs through virtually all of his uh, other uh, uh, principles and disciplines. He says, uh, fourth, do not hover always <clears throat> on the surface of things. He says uh, that the greatest approach uh, that we can ever have to our study is to go slow and go deep. Now again, that runs contrary to everything that we think. Uh, we who are harried teachers, uh, we who feel like we've got to master a thousand different things, uh, we feel like we've got to rush through things. But uh, what Watts says is slow down, uh, go deep, uh, don't, don't hover on the surface of things. Instead, uh, grapple deeply with these things. You're not going to learn everything that you want to learn anyway, so why not slow down and really learn uh, what you'd like to learn well? Fifth, he says, uh, once a day, especially in the early years of life and in the later years of life, I'm not sure why he said that that way, but uh, he did. He says, uh, especially in the early years of life and the later years of life, uh, call yourselves to account what new ideas, what new proposition nor new truth you have gained, that further confirmation of known truths and, and what advances you have made in any part of knowledge. In other words, he's saying, you need to exercise that great Puritan discipline of self-examination. Uh, evaluate where you are. Businesses do this all the time. And they sit down and they say, have we met our sales figures? Why or why not? In the life of the mind, are, are we marking our time well uh, by evaluating what's productive, what's not productive, how we're proceeding, what we're learning? Uh, can we mark the progress? Like those of us who uh, endeavor to keep going in athletics after it's way past sensibility, uh, we'll, we'll oftentimes keep little journals that will say, okay, I did three miles today and five miles yesterday. And uh, I've even seen these very elaborate journals that uh, talk about the weather and, and uh, how the aching knees feel <clears throat> and uh, paces and all of the rest. Uh, we do that in so many areas of our lives, but we rarely think about doing that in the life of the mind. Watts says, keep track, make notes, pay attention, 
exercise that Puritan discipline of self-examination. Sixth, he said, maintain a constant watch at all times against a dogmatical spirit. And the only way, he says, that this is possible is for our lives to be rooted in the wonder of the gospel. When we are stunned by the glory and the beauty of the gospel, then it is a lot harder for us to have a dogmatical and judgmental spirit and to spew constantly uh, the acidic Facebook nonsense that so characterizes our polarized world today. Seventh, you should get humility and courage enough to retract any mistake and confess an error. Uh, this is uh, what is described in the uh, little letter to the Philippians from the Apostle Paul as... Uh, as uh, that semnos, uh, that, uh, that sense of gravity, uh, a willingness uh, to come face to face with our errors, uh, to, to admit that we've changed our mind or uh, that we've made a mistake is really just to say that we're growing, that we're maturing. Eighth, he says, uh, you, uh, or excuse me, uh, yes, eighth, uh, you should uh, have care of trifling with things important and momentous or to sporting with things awful and sacred. Do not indulge a spirit of ridicule. Wow. That would put Facebook out of business. Snapchat's gone. Now, only the food pictures on Instagram would survive. <laughs> but ninth, ever maintain a virtuous and pious frame of mind. Here, uh, Watts simply turns to the scriptures themselves and claims that as we immerse ourselves in the scriptures in the midst of all of our studies, it will constantly drive us back uh, to humility before the face of God and wonder at his kindness and grace. All scripture is God-breathed. And it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, how do we maintain a, a heart of piety and, and a sense of wonder at the goodness of God? It's to immerse ourselves in the scriptures. Tenth, he says, watch against the pride of your own reason and a vain conceit of your own intellectual powers. It's astonishing, isn't it? Virtually all of his recommendations really boil down to the Apostle Paul's exhortation to the Philippians. Finally, brothers, whatsoever is true, but whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is just, Whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. But once begins his whole discourse, simply claiming that as living and holy sacrifices acceptable to God, because of the work of the gospel, we have to undertake the work of the renewal of our minds so that we may be able to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. This is what intellectual repentance looks like. At the end of the book, he gives a whole series of uh, practical applications about how to, uh, to exercise all of these 10 disciplines through things like observation, just noticing the world around you. It's astonishing, isn't it, how many people don't actually notice the world around them? This is one of the reasons why Charlotte Mason's nature studies are so important, teaching children how to actually see 
And notice, secondly, he, uh, he talks about the importance of reading. And uh, this is uh, commonplace in ACCS world, uh, but, uh, but, but reading is becoming very quickly a lost, lost art. Not, not because books aren't available, but uh, because libraries are getting rid of all of the good books. I hope you're buying them for your school. Uh, and uh, they're keeping uh, the, uh, the ripoffs of uh, Tom Clancy and Vince Flynn, and that's about it. The third, he, he talks about ways that we can maximize our learning in public and private lectures, verbal instructions uh, given by teachers. He talks about how to take good notes. He also talks about uh, the importance of good conversation. He puts forward the idea that we should create little bands, sort of small inklings groups uh, where we can prod one another on, read books together, read our own writing, uh, share thoughts from our journals. Uh, and of course, he does not neglect the question of meditation, uh, that uh, vital discipline where we think through all that we have uh, wrestled with <clears throat> so that it becomes internalized and it becomes a part of us. There's a, a recurring refrain of an old walking song in the great Middle Earth legendarium of J.R.R. Tolkien. It, it appears in both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings at strategic moments. The, the song is recited first uh, by Bilbo Baggins at the conclusion of his journey back to the Shire following his great adventure, coming through a copse of trees uh, to the top of a rise. He at long last lays eyes on his home, on the horizon. And he stops and he sings, where the roads go ever on and on, over rock and under tree, by caves where never sun has shone, by streams that never find the sea, over snow, by a winter sown, and through the merry flowers of June, over grass and over stone, and under the mountains in the moon, roads go ever on under cloud and under star, yet feet that wandering have gone, a turn at last to home afar, eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in the halls of stone, look at last on meadows green and trees and hills they long have known. Both Bilbo and Frodo sing another stanza when they depart from the Shire, this time for an even greater adventure. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door of, uh, where it began. And now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. And whither then? I, I cannot say. And Bilbo sings the final stanza in Rivendell at the end of all their adventures. The road goes ever on and on out from the door where it began. And now far ahead the road is gone. Let others follow who can. Let them a journey new begin. But I at last with weary feet will turn towards the lighted in my evening rest and sleep to meet. In 1965, uh, the British composer Donald Swan collaborated with Tolkien in composing new tunes for the song. They, they did so uh, saying that in some ways, the great life lessons of the whole Middle Earth saga could be summed up in this single, simple song. The road goes ever on and on. Knowing this should humble us. Knowing this should embolden us. Knowing this should guard us against presumption, against complacency, against hubris. Knowing this should set our feet upon the next great adventure every time we step out our front door. The road goes ever on and on. 
knowing this may well be one of the most essential lessons of good education. It's what Watts was driving home. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, once wrote in his wonderful John Plowman's talks, I would have everybody able to read and write and cipher. Indeed, I don't think a man can know too much, but mark you, the knowing of these things is not education. And there are millions of your reading and writing folk who are as ignorant as neighbor Norton's calf. And those ignorant masses of whom Spurgeon wrote are not those who failed to finish their lessons. They are instead those who did finish, or rather those who, who pridefully thought that lessons were the sorts of things that could be finished. Education does not have a terminus. It, it does not have a polar extreme, a finish line, an outcome. Instead, it is a deposit, an endowment, a promise, even a small taste of the future. For many, it is sad to say, this uniquely Christian perspective is an entirely foreign worldview, an alien notion, an arcane paradox, an unfathomable mystery. Minds dulled by the smothering hubris of popular culture cannot begin to plumb the depths or explore the breadths of a distinctively Christian virtue of hopeful, humble contentment in the face of perpetual, unending tasks. Thus, they rush toward what they think <clears throat> will be the termination of this, that, or another chapter of their lives. They cannot wait to finish school. Thus, for instance, that graduation is not a commencement for them, but a conclusion. Afterwards, uh, they hurry through their lives and their careers. Uh, they plod impatiently through their work week, anxious for the weekend. Uh, they bide their time uh, until vacation and plod on toward retirement, always coming to an end of things until at last things come to an end. But within a Christian worldview framework, hopeful, humble contentment in the face of never-ending responsibilities is a virtue that breeds in us anticipation for new beginnings, not old resolutions. It's a virtue that provokes us to a fresh confidence in the present as well as in the days yet to come. This is simply because it is a virtue that is rooted in an understanding of God's good providence and in the covenantal fortunes of his grace. We above all people, we who were brought from death to life, we who were brought from the end of ourselves to the threshold of eternity, we above all people understand this. This is, in fact, the very essence of the gospel. The crucifixion is not the termination of Christ's mediatorial work. Rather, it is the conjunction of two beginnings, the incarnation and the resurrection. It is the pivot of civilization, demarcating a whole new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Thus, we must be innately an optimistic people, the forever starting anew, affirming our faith in full accord with the patriarchs and the patristics. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But thus, uh, for example, all talk of education is for us a humbling reminder that we have only just begun to learn how to learn. It's an affirmation that uh, though our magnificent heritage has introduced us to the splendid wonders of art and music and literature and ideas of science and technology, that we have only just been introduced and a lifetime adventure in these vast and portentous arenas still awaits us. Indeed, the most valuable lessons that education can convey are invariably the lessons that never end. That is exactly what Watts was about. And if it is a cliche, so be it. It is the essence of the Christian philosophy of education. 
Arthur Quiller Cooch, the mentor of a host of literary luminaries, including C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams, and Dorothy Sayers, once described what we have received in this fashion. You are the heirs of a remarkable legacy, a legacy that has passed into your hands after no little tumult and travail a legacy that is the happy result of sacrificial human relations, no less than of stupendous human achievements, a legacy that demands of you a lifetime of vigilance and diligence so that you may in turn pass the fruits of Christian civilization on to succeeding generations. This is the essence, he said, of the biblical view, the covenantal view, the classical view of education. This is the great legacy of truth of which you are now the chief beneficiaries. As Frodo braced himself and his hobbit companions for all of the uncertainties that lay ahead of them, he recalled Bilbo's musings about the road. He used to often say that there was only one road, uh, that it was like a great river. Its springs were at every doorstep and every path was its tributary. It's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door, he used to say. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there is no knowing where you might be swept off to. The road goes ever on and on. It should humble us. It should spur us on. It should cause us uh, to yearn, uh, to grow, and to learn, as it did Watts. It should cause us to keep track of our progress and to press forward. It should cause us, as he said, uh, to uh, reduce our dogmatical spirit, our tendency to be censorious of our neighbors, to a humble kindness where hope thinks nothing difficult Despair tells us that difficulty is insurmountable, but the gospel tells us that we shall prevail. There is not much difficulty in confining the mind to contemplate what we have a great desire to know. If you get nothing from this ACCS conference but this, an insatiable hunger to grow and to learn, then we will have succeeded. This morning I had a breakfast with a young man who is wrestling with his future. He said, you know, here I am, I'm 25 years old, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life. So I repeated to him several cliches. The rabbit trail is the point. Love what you love. Love what you love in front of everyone around you. Worldviews matter. Ideas have consequences. The right thing done in the wrong way will always result in disaster. So just do the next right thing. And do that for the rest of your life and you'll be fine. The road goes ever on and on. God bless you.